welcome back to GovCon Hacks Live. I'm Ashley Duell, and I am joined by Natasha Velez. Hi, everybody. And we're going to be talking about financing your contracts tonight. Uh, we have a lot of audience questions that were submitted around this topic. There were several different scenarios provided to us, so we're going to try to go through all of the different ways that we know of and have known, even the creative ways that, that companies have uh, been able to fund their contracts. So um, with that, let me go ahead and address the questions that were submitted. I'm, I'm going to just read the questions, and then we're going to make sure that throughout the episode, we cover all of the questions that were asked. We have how to price products and get financing for the products. Having funding for a contract when it comes to paying subs and employees before you get paid. And the best niche with little money. So on that note, I'll hand it over to you to kick us off on, on sort of the lowest level funding options. And we'll kind of work our way up to the most com to the more complex types. Yeah, yeah. So I mean how does anyone get funding to get a business? Um, what's nice about the government is that you have what essentially is a contract with the government and banks that, you know, normally do business with the government understand that the government's going to pay their bill. Um, so there's minimal risk, low risk, not like no risk, but there's low risk. Um, so you have better chances of getting a loan. Um, so, I mean, we start with the small basic ones, right? Self-funding. So you save your pennies and you start small and you scale. That's always a metho methodology that, you know, a lot of people like to go with. What's something that I can do, um, but I can front the bill for 30 to 60 days and then start getting that money back using those profit margins to fund the next month and going forward from there. Um well, and three one on my list. Yeah, um, kind of like credit. a realistic approach. Okay, right. Better credit. And that actually is one of the answers to what's the best niche with little money. So, mm -hmm. you know, think about think about micro purchase thresholds, right? Yep. Ten thousand dollars or under for products, thirty five hundred for services. So products mm -hmm. is typically best. And with the example Natasha just gave, vendor or supplier credit, um, having a good relationship with your suppliers is critical. And mm -hmm. in a great situation, they're going to more or less end up fronting the government, the product, and then waiting till you get paid to be reimbursed. So that's a great yeah. point. Yeah. I had a client um, at one point she had, I think she went after a, a bid that was, I want to say about 75% hardware um, and she was struggling. So her credit cards were like maxed out. And so she went to the vendor and she was like, hey, listen, I will, I have this contract for five years. If you give me a blanket purchase order, I promise you for five years, I'm going to buy off of you. If you can help me with some net terms, if you can help me with like, don't bill me until it ships and they receive it. And if you can give me a good, um, you know, waiting for those net terms, like if you can give me like 90 days. And by that time, I should, the government should have received it, accepted it, and, and and paid their invoice. And they did because that was five years of business. And she, she was, was good at negotiating buying. too. Yeah. Yeah, it was bulk <laughs> buying. So you don't know what you don't know. And you lose literally 100% of the chances you don't take. So ask, bargain. They're business people, your business people. They lose your business instantaneously if they can't help you start in that conversation. We skipped a couple, but we, we went straight to negotiating with your vendors, right? Well, uh, I'm I'm actually kind of glad that you did that because the others on the list are going to, in most cases, require some element of credit, right? And for those of you who might be new, uh, Dun & Bradstreet is still the keeper of your business credit. So just yeah. because it was no longer required for you to register in SAM, they still do sort of manage. And they automatically report on what's out there and publicly available about your business. Now yeah. they do have very hard sales, just so you know, getting a Dunn's number is free, but Dun and Bradstreet is to your business credit, similar to um, Equifax and Experian are to your um, personal credit. So mm -hmm. you might have to 
in order to qualify for larger lines of credit with your bank or you know for lower interest rates you may have to pay duns's monthly fee for a little while while you update your credit history with them and sort of self report and when the bank checks your credit naturally you know that positive payment history including what was available on public record and what you added now is going to really more articulate or better reflect your financial stability. But unless you take proactive measures, mm -hmm. it does become difficult to get some of the options like the the loans, right? Yeah. Sometimes in you mentioned credit cards. I have had a, quite a few clients who have self-funded their contracts and simply usually because they don't know of a better way. Right. You yeah. know, I, I have one who she maxed out her credit card at a pretty high interest rate and then didn't get paid for over a year on her contract. Yeah. So that'll make that, great. That's kind of a worst case scenario. Um, mm -hmm. But I would avoid credit cards when possible. And so mm -hmm. let's say that you're established, you've built up your business credit. What are some of the options, Natasha, that would be? that would be viable for someone who has at least some line of credit? Well, you can start with your bank, your, biz, your business bank, right? Not your personal mm -hmm. bank, but your business bank. And they know your profit and loss, your balance sheets. They know how much you have coming in and out. It's in their best interest to help you. So starting a relationship and having a small business advisor at your bank and maybe, you know, having that sit down and really kind of negotiating some credit terms. So there's a couple that I can speak of from personal experience, but you have your basic, you know, small business loan, which is just a traditional bank loan. So you can, let's say, borrow $100,000 at, we'll say, I don't know what the rates are nowadays, like six, seven, eight percent, right? So at that point, you know, until you pay it back, you're paying whatever you've borrowed at that percentage. Sometimes that can be hard to get because then, again, you need to have credit. But you also need to show how much money you're bringing in, what your profit and loss looks like, what your revenue looks like for the past three years to show some stable income that you can, in fact, pay it back. So it's not just your credit, but it's also how much in finances are you, you know, how much in revenue are you bringing in so that you can prove that you need that amount of money? The next thing you can pay it back for sure. Yeah. Yes, so you're you taking a risk projections to repay. So if you have like a revenue of like 20,000 a year and you're asking for like 200,000, yeah, so be a little mess there. Yeah. So, you know, you know, it doesn't mean you won't get a loan. It just means you won't get the full amount that you're asking for. You know, they'll they'll want you to, again, scale up. So those are that's a, that's the first start. The next one is a revolving loan. A revolving loan tends to be my favorite because the bank will give you what's called a revolving loan. And let's say it's one hundred thousand dollars. So for one hundred thousand dollars, you have an account with the bank. You can borrow against that whenever you want. If you don't need it right now, that's cool. It just sits there, but you don't pay interest on it. You only pay interest on what you borrow, kind of like a credit card. So you can borrow, I only need 10,000. You take 10,000, put it in your checking account, buy your materials. Then you pay your bill back and you've only paid a percentage on the amount that you've borrowed. Now that you've paid it back, you don't have any more interest but it's always available to you should you need it. So that's my personal favorite. So I always try to look for that. Um, other than that, SBA loans, I guess. Then we go into SBA so loans. On the SBA.gov website, there mm -hmm. are several different funding options. And mm -hmm. SBA has partnered with certain lenders to sort of back the loans that they're giving you. So if you go on to SBA.gov's a loan on their website. They have the funding page. Go to loans and search for a partner, one of their partners that they've sort of more or less pre-approved. Now, one thing, you know, about loans, credit, money, collateral, that may or may not be the best first step, depending on what industry you're in. If you're commercially established, you're not going to have much trouble at all getting a loan to fund yeah. a government contract. You're probably even going to be relying on some of your profits in the commercial space. 
But for those of you that are new, definitely build a relationship, like Natasha said, with your business institution. I do like to have a smaller credit union and then also, you know, a larger bank. You know, I'm not a huge fan of some of them. I'm pretty picky. I do like PNC. A lot of these institutions will offer various programs, you know, whether it be grants, whether it be low interest loans, certain categories. So make sure that you're building the relationships is the common theme here. And right. then what you may not have to be so codependent on your business credit to do would be to consider a factoring company. And I know we've touched on this in previous episodes, but I wanted to give a little bit of a, more of an example of the terms and example terms that a factoring company or that you should expect them uh, to sort of present to you. And the way that they sort of work is, and this would be if you can't negotiate with your supplier, right? Because if you can negotiate with your supplier uh, in the previous example provided, you don't need a factoring company. You don't need to add that extra overhead onto your order, right? So the fee vary, varies based on the, the factors that the company sets forth and all the companies are different. Uh, so for one example, you know, I'll, we'll front you X amount of dollars and pay your supplier. And then you pay us 4.5% when you get paid up to the first 30 days. Now, day 31 to 60 might be 5.5 or 6.5%. So what that means is if you, let's say you're new, let's say this is your first time in wide area workflow and you're <laughs> trying to send your invoice to the government and you've missed a period or a dot somewhere oh, and yes, the well government done. does not accept your invoice, the, that clock ticks no matter what. And you're on that customer service line calling and going back and forth <laughs> and opening a You're ticket. emailing your contracting office. I'm a small <laughs> business fast pay. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Very much so. So knowing these and preemptively making sure that before you make that decision, understand wide area workflow, understand, you know, what there's a lot of training out there on wide area workflow, get with your contracting officer, you know, before it comes time where, oh crap, now my percentage is increased on my fee because I'm 45 days late and I don't know what I'm doing. Keep the communication open. Don't let yourself be in that position. Yeah. And and in regards to the factory, I mean, there's two different kinds. So really um, look into the type that you want to get. Most people, I think, really just want contract factoring. It's different than invoice factoring. So invoice factoring is if you are doing a five-year service project, right? And you have constant payroll. And every month, you don't anticipate the amount of money that you're going to get to be enough to cover next month's payroll because you have a huge operation, right? So you are, you know, the invoice factoring is I need to bill the factoring company this invoice and have them loan me the money for a fee so that I can pay my people every, you know, and you can do that, you know, semi-monthly, whatever, whenever you do payroll. It doesn't even have to be just monthly. So they keep you kind of going. It can be very expensive after a while, but that is a methodology that people use quite often. You would be surprised at the large companies that utilize that still are cash broke. And everything is just honestly provided by factoring. But if you're going to, let's say, do something that's really just a quick one and done, you're just got, I got to buy this, this, you know, piece of hardware and I got to deliver it. And it's like a three month time frame. You can look into contract funding, which you take your contract that you've been awarded. You go to the bank and you say, look, I, I'm going to get money. And so they come to you and they give you your, I think, 85 to 90 percent. They don't cover your profit, but they will cover your hard work costs. And so then they will cover your labor, whatever you need to do to fund it. They will provide you that amount. And then you are able to go ahead, execute the contract when you are paid back the bank collects their fee, their interest rather, and um, gives you back your profit. So those are two different options that you can utilize when it comes to factoring. And we do have a question from the audience. Would this be advisable for a brand new startup with no credit savings? And I, I can't be sure when it was posted and which one we were 
discussing at the time the question was asked. So T, um, if you want to elaborate, we'll be happy to sort of guide you in the right direction. And, you know, there are so many different ways. We haven't even talked about private funding yet. You know, I've yeah. actually had clients scale their businesses by, you know, giving up just a couple of percent of their their company, you know, to a shareholder that invested. That would always be an option, which you don't need any credit. Yep. To do. You need a relationship. And if you notice the common theme and the one I'm about to talk about also includes relationships, right? We've also seen where your teaming partners, your prime contractors mm -hmm. will sort of front you the money to support the con your part of the contract. Yep. And then obviously when they get paid from the government, you know, you only get the difference um, between what they owe you and what they fronted you. So the sort of driving theme here, while you're building your business credit, there are other options to fund. But the key is to be very selective on the contracts that you pursue. Um, if you're not sure how you're going to fund a contract, do not bid on it. And if you haven't done this homework and, you know, I always say pick three, you know, that's what the government does. You get, you get a few quotes, you pick the best value. Mm -hmm. right? Evaluate different companies, evaluate different lenders, see which ones have the better offer. And a lot of the time when they really want your business, they'll tell you what you need to do to get approved for that loan. You know, yeah. that might be, that might be adding some payment history to Dunn's that might be, you know, getting a smaller loan. And then in a few months, once you get that paid off, getting a larger loan to establish positive mm -hmm. payment history, like every institution is different. So I definitely recommend build a relationship with your banker. You know, they often, like Natasha says, have financial advisors on staff. They want to help you build your credit because they make more money when you, when you do, yeah. right? You know, you borrow money, they get the interest. It's kind of a win-win for everybody. Let's see if we have any more questions. Yeah. I think like if you're a new business and you're just starting, I, I know a majority of the folks that I encounter, they, they're just starting. Like you, like when they're, when I talk about like just starting your business, you just got your EIN number. You you just fun you just set up your LLC. So at that and and let's be real, I'm very straight up. Like if you, some people want to don't want to hear that. Some people don't want to hear I got I got to spend all this time building my credit and blah blah blah. I mean it's hard times for everybody. I get it. Um, it's gonna take time to build your credit. You have to have income. You die to quit that job. I don't want to do my nine to five no more. I got you. Look into factoring. Look into factoring. Factoring. You're going to pay a higher percentage to understand that. But if you get really smart and you utilize the profit margins that you make off that contract to fund your next contract versus borrowing again, you won't forever give the bank all of your profits because not everything is, you know, the most profitable. Plus, you don't want to outbid yourself if you use factoring because of the high profit margins right. that it up in. So all of that should be taken have a plan. Mm -hmm. But if you absolutely do not want to wait for credit building, if you don't have some magical person who can loan you some money and you don't have anything in savings and your credit is shot, factoring, that's all I can say. Essentially, because look, it's it's kind of low risk. You know, don't go bidding on millions of dollars in, in contracts. <laughs> I would play on, win anyway. first, you know? <laughs> play on something that's low dollar amount, low risk. Mm -hmm. Build a couple of uh, of those up, you know, so that you have past performance and you look more trustworthy to the government. You know, we, you know, there are other funding options for those of you who might have innovative products or services like the SBIR and STTR and um, DPA Title Three. I mean, that's that's an area that I've sort of just started kind of digging into myself and understanding. You know, the government does often match you in that scenario. You know, if they want to manufacture something and need something for national defense, you don't have a warehouse, you don't have a, a line, an assembly line, you know, they're willing to match your funds. So definitely check out DPA Title Three if you're interested in getting into manufacturing and are looking for ways to sort of subsidize. I've also got challenge.gov. Anybody checked out challenge.gov recently? They've got some pretty oh, what's cool that? Teach me something new today. What's challenge.gov? So, 
this came out, correct me if I'm wrong, around COVID. It, it like uh-huh. it was really super quiet. Like, crickets. Because well, that's because we were dealing with <laughs> aliens. Everybody, right. All the businesses <laughs> were closed. And you know me, the nerd that I am, I'm mm-hmm. on government websites, you know, following a rap. Well, I was playing video landed- games. <laughs> <laughs> I landed on this um, challenge.gov initiative uh-huh. where n- sort of new and innovative programs coming up with new processes. Oh, I you know, like this. Things. There was one on there related to training human trafficking, uh, human trafficking program, a way to combat that. And basically they're giving out prizes to the finalists, you know, who wins the challenge. So, you know, it's similar to kind of submitting a proposal. In a lot of cases, you're submitting a plan you know, with your proposal, and then it comes with an award. Like you, want a award. you do not have to pay back. It's it's mm-hmm. sort of free money for those of you who see innovative ways to handle, you know, some of our nation's issues. Keep an eye out on challenge.gov and see if there's something in your wheelhouse. That would be a great way to fund a contract is, is land in one of those. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Sibbers. So like sip, I'm writing one right now, Sibbers. And... Not exclusive to technology. Yeah. There is some technology, technology, but not exclusively. I have one guy. Well, I mean, we're all we're all young here. They they have, we have one guy who's like a, a game developer. He does video games and stuff like that. And he's, you know, he has like all these ideas and you know, the creative type. And um looking in Sibbers, they have tons of opportunities where you can create game development, right? Teaching the army with artificial intelligence and cadets and training them. And he just, his eyes lit up because you think that you have to have a product to sell to the government. And then you learn that the government will pay for you to innovate that product, create it. And then they will pay for you to commercialize it because it ultimately benefits them and they want innovation. They want new products. You know, we have to constantly, continuously be ahead of the game. So, yeah, there's look into all of that because it, it, you can get really excited down that rabbit hole till three in the morning. Have at it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, not today, not this week. Um, <laughs> check in with me again around summer. And that's a good point. Thank you, Deshaun. Uh, one of our viewers mentioned the Assignment of Claims Act. So, mm-hmm. for... <laughs> Here we go into FAR. You guys know how much I love. Yay, let's go. Um, <laughs> FAR 32.8. That's my FAR book. Hold up. <laughs> is the assignment of claims. So under the Assignment of Claims Act, a contractor mm-hmm. may assign due, excuse me, assign money is due or to become due under the contract if all of the following conditions are met. Mm-hmm. The contractor specifies payment ag- payments aggregating $1,000 or more. The assignment is made to a bank, a trust, or other financing institution including any federal lending agency. The contract does not prohibit the assignment and D unless otherwise expressly permitted in the contract. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Not and D. We still have plenty more to go. (laughs) Unless otherwise expressly permitted in the contract, the assignment covers the unpaid amounts payable under the contract is made only to one party, except Mm -hmm. that any assignment may be made to one party as an agent or trustee and is not subject to further assignment. So you can't go in assignment again. Lastly, this one is the last one, I promise. The assignee sends a written notice of assignment together with the true copy of the assignment instrument to the contracting officer or agency head, surety on any bond applicable to the contract, and dispersing officer designated in the contract to make payment. Um, I I think it's really amazing that someone actually knew that. Yeah, I appreciate it. More impressed. I'm like, very yeah. much. Deshaun, acquisitions.gov, folks. Acquisitions.gov. Yeah. Yep. Acquisition.gov. Um, well, it's easier than the book we read. Things. What's that? Easier than, I said it's easier than reading the FAR book that we read and the classes that we had to take. No. Very not much so. I've been consumed with a DAU for the past <laughs> year and a half. So um, it's, 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 it's mind numbing. And I have to say, those of you who are in government, and you look at that and use that all day, every day, my heart goes out to you. Thank you for what you do because I'm a strategist. I like the strategy. I like figuring out, you know, following the money, figuring out who buys what I sell, how do they buy what I sell, and how am I going to get that business? Like, that's my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. But I know in order to get there, 
you know, sometimes we have to make sure that we're planning appropriately. And that's why we wanted to have this today. I hope that we were able to answer the questions that were previously submitted. And um, we are planning our sessions out. We are going to be having some guests. So if anyone listening in today would like to be a guest, please do reach out to myself, reach out to Natasha. We would love to have you on. Whether you're a contractor, you want to tell your story. You know, I, I love that. I love hearing how, you know, those who are really making a dent in the government contracting space, how they first started. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes it's hard to believe. And those stories are very much how much of our, you know, much of our audience are feeling now. You know, I can seem like a long sales process and it is, it very much is, but it's the nature of the beast and there's a huge reward at the end of the day. Yeah. And I, we always say it, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Right. So if it's worth it, it's, it's gotta be a little hard. It's gotta be a little hard, right. but it is very much worth it. So lessons learned. I would love to have people jumping on and sharing their lessons learned, what they wish they would have known before they got into it, how hard it was for them or how easy it was for them. I'm definitely really excited about having um, some guests on. Yes. And it's also excellent to get perspectives from different industries because mm -hmm. contrary to popular belief, you know, those who have a vested interest to sell you a $10,000 course um, are not going to tell you that your strategy is going to be completely dependent on what it is you do. <laughs> I, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything for anyone. Um, I do not give very much advice to anyone in particular, unless I have looked at their market. I have checked the yeah. propensity. You know, I, I know that way I can guide you as to what you're going to need, how you're going to do it. And mm -hmm. the actual timeline, the timeline expectation is important. Yeah, it really is. But yeah. also don't discount subcontracting because if you have one of those valuable skill sets and, you know, you might make uh, or bring value to an existing contract, you know, I've seen prime sponsor facility clearances. I've seen them literally outright. Oh yeah. Those are the give best. You access to their gov win. Mm -hmm. I mean, all their resources. Like their proposal team becomes your proposal team. I mean, mm -hmm. and you become and folks, rich overnight, barely. Right? <laughs> you got a this whole operational set, set up. Like that's yes, it. Yes. It's always been a relationships game. And it's mm -hmm. only literally been in the last two to three years that, you know, there's ever been anything different said. So yeah, that's true. That's true. Trust, true. but verify everything you hear. Make sure that you are um, just yeah. doing your due diligence. And if all else fails, check usaspending.gov. It's free. So um, don't let anyone sell you on anything that may not be appropriate for your industry. Well, my dear, it has been a pleasure. As always, next Thursday to everyone. Yes, next Thursday, same time, same place. And we are going to talk about building your GovCon dream team how to grow your team. You know, a lot of us, most of us start out as just one person. Yep. What's like the that. next essential team member that you need? So join us next week, same time, same place. That's what we're going to dig into. All right, guys, have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.